This classic episode of the Electric Playground is brought to you by PNP Games, your source for everything video games. Support the partners that support Electric Playground. Remember, this episode first aired in 1997. This week on the Electric Playground. So anything that's playable over a LAN is playable over heat. So sure. games like Worldwide Soccer, uh, mm -hmm. which is actually a Sega title mm -hmm. that's coming, will be playable on Heat.net. Gex, obviously, compared to the first one, is like night and day because it's a full 3D uh, environment, much like Mario. But uh, we've been able to accomplish getting fully textured environments with no sacrifice to real-time gameplay. When I started at Nintendo of America in 1991, we had just introduced the Super NES. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System showed exactly how far video games had come. Online multiplayer gaming is becoming huge. Now there's a lot of different options available out there, but let me tell you about EP's favorite. It's Segasoft's Heat.net. Cyber Diversion Theory is saying that we all have innate aggressive urges. Right. And if we can acknowledge those and take them to the internet um, where you know cyber bullets cause no pain, yeah. the world would be a better place. And, sure. and generally speaking, it would be a more peaceful place. The wars of the future could be contests that are fought online kind of thing. Exactly. You know, anything that's playable over a LAN is playable over heat. So sure. games like Worldwide Soccer, um, mm -hmm. which is actually a Sega title mm -hmm. that's coming, will be playable on heat.net. Just like a Sega Saturn or a Sega Genesis was a platform, we look at the internet in the same way. We design games that were designed for the internet, taking advantage of the multiplayer experience. And we do that from ground up. We don't start with a PC game or a console game and then try to port it to the internet. All of the games that we're doing start with the internet as a basic requirement. We have a, a martial arts game called Netfighter, which is the first fighting game ever on the internet. And part of the reason you haven't seen that is because of the latency problems right. that you may encounter. The problem in the past has been, you know, getting all of the control pad thingies back and forth between two computers. Exactly. In uh, a little more understandable terms, I would say that different from playing on an arcade machine, where you see a lot of fighting games, where the information is being transferred right there, it's local, you have now what's called latency, where it takes time for packets of information to be sent back and forth between players. We're not playing on a LAN here, we're actually playing over heat right. as we speak. So, so we're on the internet right now as we talk. Absolutely. Nice move. Now, of course. How do you think I got to be the host of this show on my uh, good looks alone? The software is actually dealing with the latency. Right. So it will anticipate moves somewhat to at least show some sort of a, a ghosting. You know, it'll code in the ghosting. So you still see the movement and you can't tell there was latency. And cool. when you press the button, it happens. We're doing everything we can to reduce the lag. Right. And in a game like Netfighter that's addressing the lag, a 28.8 and a T1 will play virtually the same. Now, if I'm a consumer, how do I get to play Netfighter? What do I have to do? Do I buy it in a store? Do I log on to a website? What's the deal? Both, actually. Either one. Uh, you can go to the stores right now. It's out. The heat package includes Netfighter, Alien Race, Scud, and uh, all kinds of other good stuff. And you can go on to heat with that retail package. And you can play Netfighter right off to load your CD, go on to heat.net site, and you can play. If you don't want to buy the disc or you just want to go in, you can play Netfighter for free. Go to heat.net and you can download it. People talk about online gaming is possibly taking over the, the console market. I tell you, online gaming is the future. If you've ever played Quake against the computer and then played Quake online against human opponents, I guarantee you will never go back and play against the computer again. I heard there's some new technologies being introduced with Heat. One of them is Transactor. What it does, it allows you to take anything in a game, like a character or a weapon or a vehicle or a level, anything. It wraps it in encryption technology. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like baseball cards or Magic the Gathering type okay. cards where you have a limited number of objects. So we can have maybe only 10 of a certain type of weapon 
or character and we put them out there and then people have to fight for them and they can oh, trade cool. and buy and sell. So it, the objects themselves become changeable. And, and collectible. Yeah, and collectible and so it, it changes valuable, exactly. Coming up after the break, the color green. Uh, hi, I'm Paul. Friends call me Paulie B. And I've been Lord D's maintenance guy for the past two and a half years. Keeps me on my toes. Cleared a flea man infestation last week. Little buggers get everywhere. Yeah, I know he's there. D don't acknowledge him. He's never gonna stop. If you guys thought Gex and Pandemonium 2 were cool, wait till you see them this year. Gex 2 and Pandemonium 2 from Crystal D. What's different about Gex now? Well, Gex obviously compared to the first one is like night and day because it's a full 3D uh, environment, much like Mario. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been able to accomplish getting fully textured environments with no sacrifice to real-time gameplay. We're trying to create uh, the goal of providing Naughty Dog, Crash, uh, Bandicoot-like environments, but in a complete free-roaming uh, experience. How are you guys able to achieve that on the PlayStation? Uh, we pretty much have uh, two of the best programmers in the business. Adrian Longlin and Danny Chan uh, were the first people, as far as we know, in North America or any English-speaking country to uh, throw away the Sony tools and they just rewrote him from scratch. One thing that impressed me about this game right away is that Gex himself looks seamless. He doesn't seem to have any of the tears or ripping polygons that you see in a lot of other characters. How, how did you guys get that done? We basically morph a skin around a skeletal system. So rather than having pieces of polygon, one for the arm, one for the leg, which is what you saw in the whole early generation of uh, real-time uh, polygonal characters, we actually have one sort of bag which makes up Gex. And in order to animate him, you just stretch the bag in different directions. You won't get any pop, and, and I think no matter how close you get, he's, he holds up. You've designed the game specifically to use uh, the PlayStation analog controllers. How, how did that come about? Uh, we'd spend a long time trying to make sure we had a compelling gameplay experience. We came up with a, a game uh, control spec, which allows you to move the camera in 360 degrees yep. and then move Gex relative to what your camera position is. Essentially, it allows us to not be constrained to six points of direction. How about the voice? How about Dana Gould? You're, you're going to see Gex fully lip syncing wow. um, all, the, all of his voices all the way through it. How can you do that? We have a full system of bones in Gex's head. Uh, he has a tongue, he has teeth. He actually evidently has more bones in the model here than actually a real gecko. There is no other game that I think will compare to Gex. Um, we, I think there are pieces of Gex that are related to Mario. Um, I don't think uh, games like Blasto have a chance against it. I think it fits into a really neat and, and clearly defined category of attitude car cartoon characters. I loved Pandemonium 1. Uh, we gave it, actually, at the Electric Playground, we gave it a, a blister award for the best 2.5D platformer of 1996. Great. Thank you. It ruled. Everything you liked about Pandemonium 1 uh, just blown out even more. The first game had amazing uh, CG. Uh, rendered intros and cutscenes. It had some really cool characters. Your choice of playing a couple of different ones and uh, some really interesting worlds. How are you guys going to top something like that? We just went absolutely berserk with this one. Not necessarily like psychedelia for its cheapness sake, you know, like you know, wacky lollipops or whatnot, but just really, you know, mind tripping stuff. We might actually stop the controller just to, just to look at the screen. On this game, sort of took the characters again and really beefed them up to make them even more crazier and uh, uh, well. Sexier as well, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Fargus, I always thought he kind of got the short end of the stick a little bit. He kind of gesture that doesn't really, you know, what do gestures do? Well, they juggle and they make jokes. And this one, he's just Liberace gone crazy. He's just oh, nuts. Good. I mean, yeah, again, the, the mad, mad character with, with total destructive power. You know. What are some of the worlds? What are some of the, the crazy new levels like, that are in the game? I mean, we start the game in. in Back on the familiar world of Lear, you know, with the you know, beautiful rolling hills and the waterfalls and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And as you escalate through the game and go into outer space, into the uh, this comet, it just all the rules get broken. You know, it's uh, crazy. You know, 
what do you say, pu pustule mushrooms. I mean, that kind of yeah. uh, insanity textures and glowing lights. And again, you, you know what's going on. You can, you can totally run through the game and not yeah. be lost. But uh, man, if you ever stop yeah. and actually look at the graphics, it's just woo! You didn't do a whole bunch of drugs before you Absolutely started? Absolutely not. No, right. we don't do that kind of thing here. From level to level, it's just totally different. You know, the whole new world to explore. It really helps motivate you to see, you know, what could possibly come next. What are they going to throw in the next? The team has never, never had this kind of creative control compared to the last game. We're all together now, the artists, designers, yeah. and uh, it's really it's just it's the whole piece in and of itself is just amazing. There's nothing else like it. So any uh, spin-off ideas for the characters at all? Is there going to be a pandemonium TV show or any kinds of toys or anything? Well, we're looking at the, uh, I mean, we have some, some partners who are in the toy line, so we're thinking the, there's these things called the egoids that you see, these little uh, Cute little, uh, a very, very uh, Japanese pink little guy as it bounces around. Those are, just be a great plush toy. Yeah. Great plush toy. Cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, the new, the new outfits on the characters, it's, I don't know, it's perfect. Perfect for Saturday morning. There was a lot more than just green in there. There was yellow and purple and yellow. I'm Kelly Benson, and we're here with the Electric Playground. We are looking for anything to do with Mario Brothers. There's a little Game Boy comic book. There's Mario standing on top of the Game Boy. Now, check this out. She's saying, eat my dust, you punk plumbers. Do you know where we can find the original Mario? Yeah, my niece's bedroom. Hey, is this the original Super Mario's? Super Mario Brothers for the NES. Now, it's tattoo time. Have you ever done a Mario tattoo? Actually, no. Would you like to give me a Mario Brothers tattoo? Sure. Okay, would you like to do this one, right here? The little Mario guy, sure. Okay, let's do it. Hey, come on, hey, sit still. Can I get Sonic on the other side now? Nintendo, you ever hear of them? Well, they started out a long time ago manufacturing playing cards, and now they're doing um, video games. Seems to be working out pretty good for them. It's me, Alan. Hello. The first product that Nintendo ever made was these Hanafuda playing cards. A very popular playing card game in Japan all the way through the 1950s when we got a license from Walt Disney to make Disney playing cards, which really increased the company's revenue because a lot of kids started getting into our games. Oh yeah, this brings back memories. 1980 marked Donkey Kong, the first game of Shigeru Miyamoto, now the master of international video gaming. Donkey Kong, of course, marked a departure from the rest of the video games in that it had multiple levels, multiple scenes, and the difficulty would raise every single level you passed. Hey, if you guys hang out long enough, I can take you to third elevators. Many people in North America won't recognize this unit, but in 1983, Nintendo put out its first home video game system, the Family Computer, more commonly known as the Famicom. Now, as opposed to the previous games where you had a one-screen static game, you could travel from screen to screen to screen and follow, for example, the Super Mario Brothers through an entire quest. Although you might not recognize this machine, the next machine to come out in 1985 in America was the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is the exact same computer as the Famicom with a beefier case and longer cords on the controllers to satisfy the bigger homes and uh, frankly more brutal playing style of North American gamers. We we'll also recognize Rob, our robotic operating buddy. Rob was able to interact with the television by scanning it with infrared. As you played Gyromiter Stack Up, Rob would grab these little gyros in here and move them to appropriate places on the board. So in essence, he was an interactive accessory that watched your TV as you played the game. Hey, cool. In 1989, Nintendo introduced our first portable video game player, the Game Boy. After initial popularity at launch, we decided that the original unit was a little large so we shrunk it down to a more manageable, more portable size. Over the years, we've launched more and more exciting versions of the Game Boy, up to and including the last one, the Game Boy Pocket Colors, which has fantastic screen clarity, 
30% less weight and 30% less filling. <laughs> Tastes great. They know a certain number of phrases and that's it. When I started a Nintendo of America in 1991, we had just introduced the Super NES. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System showed exactly how far video games had come. Now we were introducing 16-bit processing and true power for the player. In 1995, we introduced Virtual Boy, and the really cool thing that nobody realizes about Virtual Boy is that before it was debuted as a video game system, it was used exclusively by the Department of Defense for helicopter and tank weapon systems. At the uh, end of 1993, Nintendo announced a joint project with Silicon Graphics to produce a totally new game player. What we were doing is we were taking about $14.5 million worth of technology at that time and shrinking it down into a box that people could have on top of the TV sets and play games that had video quality uh, that was unparalleled at that point. Here we go! Yes, now the development on this machine took quite a while because what we were trying to do is literally shrink all of this stuff but not lose any of the quality that SGI has in their processors. So as the engineers went along, they kept on discovering these little things that they could put in or add or take away to increase the power of the system, make it more efficient, and make it the best integrated product possible. My little cousins call me up from California occasionally when a new game comes out. I've got friends back east uh, who most recently called up and demanded that I FedEx one day the copy of Goldeneye back to him. So it's kind of like being a doctor too, you know, every time you go to a party there's people who walk up to you and instead of saying that their elbow hurts, they come up and say, oh, I'm stuck in this level of Mario and I can't find the star and man, you've got to help me. It's quite satisfying to sit down and pick up a controller and blow people's minds occasionally. Hey, I'm Lee from PMP Games, and we're honored to bring you classic episodes of the Electric Playground every Saturday morning. Visit us on our web store at pmpgamesonline.com, or if you're in Winnipeg, at one of our three retail locations at 915 McLeod, 2609 Portage, and 160 Meadowood Drive. We're going to play forever. Now, back to the show. Hey, today on the Sympatico Question of the Week, Mickey Hutton from Brandon, Manitoba asks... What is Mario's last name? Thanks for the question. Mario first appeared in Donkey Kong, Nintendo's first game. At this point, he didn't really have a proper first name even. We just knew he was a carpenter, so we didn't know his profession. Then as time went along, this is Donkey Kong Jr., well, it's the manual, but he did get a name. He's Mario, as we all know and love him today. Failing as a carpenter, Mario went into the plumbing profession with his brother Luigi in this game, Mario Brothers. Presumably, Luigi Mario, then Mario Mario. So there you have it. Don't forget to send your questions to ep.simpatico.ca. Treasures of the Deep for the PlayStation. Now here's a game, I've been involved with this game for the last two years. Yep. I you know, did the music and sound effects for it, which I thought were great, by the way. I don't yeah. know. But I'm completely impartial. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, the graphics in this game are amazing. The story is incredible. A game by Namco, uh, the, the control is excellent. There's so many creatures in there. Yeah. Dolphins, sharks, yep. uh, and, and, and you know, you're know you shooting people underwater, and it's just, and it's completely 3D. I mean, you can take your sub, go up, and actually look at the, the, the sea level there. All the missions are different. Sometimes yeah. you're hunting for treasure, other times you need to, you know, be a, be a scout for missions. Sometimes yep. you're looking for stuff, sometimes you're recovering a black box, you're, you're in awesome caves. Awesome equipment, awesome weapons, beautiful graphics. 
the uh, the music is excellent. You did a great job on the music and the sound effects. You really feel like you're floating underwater. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's easily the best sort of submersible game on the play. It's like playing the Thunderball James Bond underwater stuff. And oh. you're, just, you're cruising around. It's, it's amazing. A, it's like a combination of the Abyss, Indiana Jones, and like Tomb Raider underwater. Terrific all game. in one. Terrific it, game. Totally I give it Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. I'm at nine point four on 9. this 4. game. I had absolute fun. Make sure you check it out. What about Tetrisphere for the Nintendo 64? Tetrisphere uh, didn't really do anything for me. I, I thought it was a little too complex. I mean, I, I played it for a couple hours, and I was just finding myself like spinning this thing, and then, okay, it lights up. I don't know why, and yeah. I don't know how, but I'm just gonna press the button anyway, because I know it does something. Yeah. And when you're playing in two-player mode, you know, I never even saw your half of the screen. Yeah. I was always like fixed to my half. Yeah, it you, wasn't like we were playing against. You don't get that sense that you're, you're you're, like, uh, oh, I gotta do something me before up he at does. All. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I didn't really enjoy it that much. You know, I, I give it about a five on a scale of one to ten. Five out of ten. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of share some of your sentiments there. It, it is too complex. It has this really extensive. Uh, training mode at the top of the game. When you plug it in, you first turn it on, it sort of teaches you how to play. Right. It goes on for half an hour, you know? And I think the secret to a good puzzle game is it's simple to, yeah, simple to pick up and addictive as hell. And Tetrisphere has some of those elements, but it, you're, you have to work to find them. I would like to be able to spin the ball around a little quicker too. The faster. sphere, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. When, it, when it starts to get like closer and closer, it's like, whoa, yeah. you know? It's still not a game that, that you keep coming back to. Whoa. Six out of 10. What about That's Jedi cool. Knight for the PC? Wow, yeah. Jedi Knight for the PC. I tell you what, you guys were playing it in the other room, and I was I was sitting there, uh, you know, uh, reading a book. No, I was playing a game. And um, <laughs> you let should me, read books, though. I thought that you guys were like watching the Star Wars movie over there just by no, listening to it. No. The sound in this game is so intense. We were each trying to kick each other off the machine. We're like, my turn to play, my turn to play. It's yep. one of those games yep. where you Kill just got to, you get in there. It's obviously, it's like a Doom or Quake type of game. Yep. Uh, I thought the background though is, is, is amazing. But if you're not into first person shooters, you should pick this one up because it's it's Star Wars to yep. begin with. And yep. anything Star Wars, I got to buy. It's you know? got a chase view too as well. So it's not all first person. It can go in sort of a Tomb Raider mode. And pop behind your character and cruise right. around like that. I never did that. The, the missions are, are pretty intense too. Yep. The missions, there's there's a bunch of different missions. The graphics are excellent. Uh, I like the cutscenes too. I mean, they're very professional. You know, they're not. They look great. Yeah, they, they, they do look great. You know? Again, if you're not into first person shooters and you want to get into them, get this game. There's this nothing is... like Jedi Knight out there. I it, love it's, it. It's, uh, it's multiplayer. You can cruise around with 3D acceleration card on there. It looks beautiful. The backgrounds are amazing. The atmosphere in that game, again, is just terrific. <laughs> wow. It is something that Star Wars fans everywhere are just going to devour. 8.9 in my book. 8.9? Yeah. I'd, I'd give it a 9.5. Abe's Odyssey, Sony PlayStation. Abe's Odyssey is another amazing game. But, whoa! That's all right. Easy trigger. We're going. All right. Uh, it's a 2D side-scrolling uh, sprite-based uh, platform game. This is another uh, another game where there's just so much detail and yep. the art is just so beautiful. Atmosphere. Um, it's Again, incredible. The music, sounds are yeah, amazing. The I mean, there's not a lot of, you know, there's not as much, you know, there's not tons of music and stuff, but it's all atmosphere and the sounds are just totally get you in. The game speak in this is amazing. Yeah. Hello, hello, follow me. Okay. where you actually have to go around and you talk to characters yeah. on screen and yeah. each button is a different word to say the character. I love the way you can possess other characters. Yeah. The humor in it is amazing. Yeah. I mean, just everything about it is, is incredible. Yeah. Uh, 9.5 for me. Yeah, Abe's Odyssey is amazing. I'd give it a 9 out of 10. All right, here we go. Hello, hello, follow me. Okay. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> It's time to power down the playground. We'll see you next week. Hey! <laughs> Production assistance for the electric playground was provided by Nintendo of Canada and Heat.net. Okay, ready? Here we go.
This classic episode of the Electric Playground was brought to you by PNP Games, your source for everything video games. Support the partners that support the Electric Playground. Thanks for watching and play forever.